Good morning, everyone. Good Easter morning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's pray. God, we come to you this morning and we seek to understand the power of your resurrection. Speak to our hearts today. Amen. This morning, we finally come. We've been waiting an entire year, and it truly feels like we've been waiting an entire year for the resurrection. Many of us have suffered loss, hardship, difficulty over this past year, and this morning we are truly hungry for some resurrection power. So let's get to it. And uh, we break in right at the beginning of Mark 16 um, in this final um, sermon on the series on the, on the book of Mark. And right here at the very beginning, this verse hit me so hard when I read it. So verse 1 of, of chapter 16 says, When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spi brought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. And the, the phrase that hit me so hard was, when the Sabbath was over. I had never thought before about that day between and how the women might have been feeling for that entire very long day. And I wondered, who were these women? What did they know about Jesus? What might they have been experiencing on this very longest of Sabbath days? And so we look back to a verse just in the chapter before, and it tells us a little about the women. It says, some women were watching, watching Jesus on the cross, from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph, and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. These women had witnessed the entire thing. They had, they had stood by and watched, helpless, powerless, as Jesus was taken and cruelly put on a cross. And these women had the privilege, maybe the honor or the horror of staying at the cross. Being women, there was really no threat to them because women were not counted valuable enough to crucify or to suffer the same fate as Jesus. So the men may have experienced fear and run from the cross. The women, because of their invisibility, because of their place in society, could stay. And this filled them with, I'm sure, great horror to have to watch their beloved Jesus and all that he experienced. And then it was over and they went home and they had to stay home. This very longest of Sabbath days, there was nothing they could do. They had to sit and process and think about what they had witnessed. I wonder how they might have felt. I'm sure I, I know a little about how they might have felt. Um, recently, my mom was in hospital and I felt entirely helpless. In fact, um, as her stay went on and we seem to be getting farther and farther from her healing, from her getting better. My sisters and my brother and I felt entirely helpless and powerless, and all we could do was sit and watch, and it was a terrible feeling. And it reminds me of the purpose of this Sabbath itself when it was given all the way back to uh, Moses and the, and the chosen people of God. Um, this Sabbath was given as a gift. It was given as a reminder that you are more than your productivity, that you are more than what you contribute. Your worth, your value is there even when you do nothing. And, and this Sabbath was a reminder of powerlessness in a way. There's nothing you can do, just be. And instead of embracing this lesson over the years, the Jews had actually had turned this Sabbath into a rule. They had turned it into something they did, a performance. And Jesus calls them out on it earlier in Mark when he says, um, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And this Sabbath had ceased to be a gift. And here on this longest day, longest of Sabbath days for these women, I'm sure they felt the full weight of the powerlessness of having to sit and not do anything. And I'm sure that they planned what they would do on the next morning, the Sunday morning, they would take their spices and go to anoint the body of Jesus. 
Let's take a look for a moment at what the world was like for these women and what the world was like in their day. Because um, the world was very unique. When I look up the, uh, the time period in Wikipedia, I learn about something called Pax Romana. It was, a, it was a period of relative peace and stability across the Roman Empire, and it lasted for over 200 years, beginning with the reign of Augustus. The aim of Augustus and his successors was to guarantee law, order, and security within the empire, even if this meant separating it from the rest of the world and defending or even expanding its borders through military intervention and conquest. Augustus was given special powers for life by the Senate. He would use these powers to control every aspect of Roman life. This level of power did indeed create a kind of peace. You know, it doesn't sound too bad. In fact, this article in Wikipedia goes on to say that this was a very peaceful time for the Roman Empire. But their version of peace, which seemed orderly and effective, it seemed good, it looks nice on the outside. In the end, this kind of power put God on a cross. This kind of power, it looks good on the outside, but those who pay for it, those who pay the price for Pax Romana, the kind of peace that comes from overpowering your enemies, are indeed the outsider, the weak and the powerless. Those are the ones who suffer, and those in power just gain more and more and more power. This kind of power is not part of the kingdom that Jesus was bringing. And we can see this kind of power in our world today. Indeed, sometimes I can see this kind of power, the desire for it in my own heart. I think if, even, what if, what if I could create this kind of peace? What if everyone just thought the way I did or would just do things the way I do them? What if I could get everyone to value Christian values and follow these things? Maybe, maybe the end would justify the means if we could just force it upon them. But Jesus never followed this kind of power. He didn't follow this path. And it's really easy to see why and how the, the Roman authorities would put Jesus on a cross. He opposed their, their ideas and their ways. And it's really easy to see, of course, they would put Jesus on a cross. What is d more difficult and confusing is to imagine how God's chosen people, the chief priests, put Jesus on a cross. How did they come to be part of this? And, um, you know, they, they watched Jesus, and they were impressed by his authority, by his miracles, by his teaching. But his kind of teaching threatened, threatened their power. We can read about it in, in John 11. I'll just read a few verses. Um, it says, Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is the, this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then one of them, named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. You know, the chief priests and the Pharisees, they knew their power was precarious. If they weren't careful, the Romans would remove even the power that they had. Their nation, everything they held dear, that would be lost. And they were God's chosen people. They had important things to do. They had to dis display for the world what this relationship with God looked like, so they had to hold on to this power. You know, from the luxury of 2,000 years distance, we can see that they didn't actually have any power at all. But they thought they did, and they were willing to risk everything. Or actually, they were willing to risk the one they thought was disposable. In this case, Jesus was literally the least of these. In their eyes, he was disposable, and they could put him on a cross to save their nation. So what was it that turned God's chosen people against the begotten Son of God that had been sent? It was fear. It was fear of being powerless. And this fear held something over them that in fact was more dangerous than power itself. 
So let's go back to the women, because here we are on this road on this Sunday morning, and I know that you're all anticipating with me getting to the tomb and this moment of resurrection. Um, so these women are walking along, and we find them walking with their spices, and we wonder, why is it the women that are going? Where are all the men? And how come these women are headed to the tomb? Is it because women are indeed a superior gender? No, it is not for that reason. It is actually because they are less afraid of powerlessness. And women in, this, in that century were indeed powerless. They experienced powerlessness every day. They were required by social standards to make themselves invisible. They were not able to speak with men out in public. Um, their, their word was counted as nothing. In fact, they were less valuable than the livestock they saw in the fields as they walked by. And they knew this. They were aware of this. And so their power was nothing compared to the power all around them. They experienced powerlessness, and so they were not afraid of it. And so when they saw Jesus powerless on the cross, when they witnessed him experiencing the shame and the humiliation of the cross, it didn't frighten them. In fact, he, they felt he is one of us. They felt compassion for him. You know, we might say this was true of women back then, but I would say it is still true of women today. Ask any woman in your life if she has experienced fear as she has walked on a road at night. You know, statistics say um, that eight out of every 10 women have experienced sexual assault of some kind or another. Women today are well acquainted with powerlessness. We are valued as less than men in our pay, in the types of jobs that we are offered. These are the kinds of things that in themselves are not something that has to do with the kingdom. But in the, the view of, of how we value one another and whether we count each other equal, it has everything to do with the kingdom. Jesus came and brought a kingdom and a belief system and teachings that said we are all equal and we are all valuable. And so we have these women, these women who are so acquainted with powerlessness and they are walking down this road and they are headed to the tomb. They are walking straight toward death. Let's read the verse. Mark 16, verses 2 and 3, it says, Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, Who will roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb? You know, even their conversation shows that they were not afraid of their own powerlessness. They're walking along saying, we can't roll away the stone. We don't have the power. We don't have the strength. I wonder how we'll get there. It did not deter them. It did not keep them from going. Off they went. They were walking towards death. And what did they expect to find? A dead body. A lifeless body is what they expected to find. Nothing that would give them back anything. They were going to give to honor and to care for their friend, who at this point, I'm sure they were not even certain anymore had been the Son of God. I'm sure there were lots of questions about who this Jesus had been, and there was lots of conflict between his teaching and what they had just witnessed two days or day and a half before. So I want to take another look at uh, a look at another woman from earlier in Mark who also was unafraid of powerlessness because these these women figures who who do not need to do things that can be measured or counted but do them out of a, a, a bravery a courage and a lack of fear of powerlessness is something that we often miss so let's take a look at this other woman it's from Mark chapter 12 verses 41 to 44 it says, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few pence. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth but she, out of her poverty, 
put in everything, all she had to live on. What we're asked to give to God is not some grand thing, but it is everything. Are we willing to give everything when it isn't grand? This widow could give everything, not because it wasn't much, but because she knew how to live without. She knew how to live without power. She was not afraid to have nothing because she had experienced that before. And because she had experienced that before, it gave her a kind of power over fear, a power over powerlessness. So what, the, what made these women, Mary and Mary and Salome, so ready to give? What gave them the ability, the courage, to walk toward death, knowing that what they would find there was a lifeless body, or believing that that's what they would find? It was because they could go because they had compassion. When they watched Jesus suffer humiliation and shame and powerlessness, instead of judging him or being angry at him or hating him or being confused, they had compassion because they had felt that way before. And they could recognize it. And they saw Jesus' humanity. We believe as, as Christians, we say we believe that Jesus was fully God and fully human. But sometimes we focus a little more on his godliness, on, on the fact that he was fully God. And we forget that he was fully human. And these women, they, they saw his humanity. They may not even have, have fully recognized that he was God. But they saw his humanity, and that humanity, that compassion for the fact that here was a human being who had experienced death in such a cruel way, that drew them to the tomb. You know, it wasn't theology or orthodoxy or anything else that drew these women there. It was love. It was love for their friend. And they took spices to anoint his body before it would be consumed by the earth. And they wanted to give him that last dignity and honor, not because they owed it to him or because they felt obligated, but because they loved him. When we find ourselves in a place of powerlessness, what can we do? Do we have the ability to lean in and feel it, feel that powerlessness? Or do we want to just find ways to control it? I know that that's often what happens in my heart. I grasp after things. When my mom was in hospital, we kept having things, well, if if this just happens, it'll all be okay. And then that thing would happen, and it wouldn't be okay. And so then we'd find the next thing. You know, if the doctors can just figure out what's causing this, then it'll all be okay. And then they figured it out, and then it wasn't okay. And so probably a succession of six different hopes that we grasped onto, my siblings and I and, and my dad, that were just left empty. They, they crumbled like dust until, you know, in the end she had to have a surgery that we knew was not 100%. We didn't know the outcome. The doctors didn't know what they would find when they got in there. And so we had to face that um, there is nothing more to grasp onto. This, we are entirely powerless. This outcome of this surgery, we have no control over. And when we looked that in the face. What we were left holding on to was not a powerful God. A powerful God meant nothing to me when my mom was going into surgery and facing death, potentially. What mattered to me was a good and a kind God, a God who had compassion and a God who would give out of that goodness. And that is where these women were. These women were looking for love. These women went and acted out of love. If powerless, if powerlessness doesn't cripple us, then we have the ability to pray. We have the ability to ask God to birth something new right in the middle of our own heartbreak, right in the middle of our own disappointment and despair. Often God doesn't take things away because God is creator. God creates. He gives more. And so when we are in a place where we would love for God to take something away and he doesn't, do we have the courage to ask for something new, for something to grow out of this, for something to be birthed by this, what feels like death? 
And that's what these women, they didn't know they were headed to the, to the empty tomb. They didn't know they were headed to something new being birthed, but they had headed there anyway. You know, right now I'm surrounded by many people who are bearing the weight of suffering. Their situations have placed them in places of extreme powerlessness. And I can't tell them how to, what to think or how to respond. I am in awe of the weight of their suffering. And all I can do is speak from a place of my own powerlessness. When I go to places where I feel powerless, then I have something to offer. And if you struggle with Jesus' call to powerlessness, if you think, no way, Jesus called us to victory, not to powerlessness, then I would urge you to speak to someone who is experiencing powerlessness right now. We heard from Nadine a few weeks ago, and I think we were all moved and we all felt the, the power of her powerlessness, the weight, the gift, the ability, the lens that it gave her to see, to see God. And so find someone, seek someone out who is experiencing powerlessness. Go to that place in your own heart that maybe you've walled off where you experience powerlessness and seek out a lens to see what it is God is calling us to as we head toward the tomb, as we head toward what we think is certain death. God had the gift of resurrection waiting all the time, that whole time as the women were walking toward the tomb, but they didn't know it. That gift that could only be born out of death awaited whoever came seeking. And it was the women who came. But they weren't seeking resurrection. They were seeking love. They were seeking compassion. They were seeking to give. They came prompted by compassion in their own heart. And I think back to when I became a Christian and when I came to Jesus. I wasn't looking for power. I didn't choose Jesus over Buddha. I didn't, I didn't weigh things up and logically say, well, this man has all the answers. No, actually, it was something, it was a prompting in my own heart that called me to Jesus. I felt his presence near me in a painful and powerless place in my life. And that was what I was after. That was what caused me to desire to seek and follow this person, this Christ, who has been here from the foundation of the world. And this calling, this Christ calling to Christ, this what is created in God's image in me, recognizing the powerlessness and the love and the compassion in Jesus, who comes and sits beside me in my hurt, this is what called me to Christ. This is what makes me want to be a Christian. And um, these women... This was what brought them to the tomb, not knowing that they were about to receive this unexpected gift. They didn't evaluate the worthiness of this disgraced rabbi. They came out of love for their friend. So let's read the next verse, Mark, four, or Mark 16, verses 4 to 6. It says, When they, the women, looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. This, this moment when these women are given this gift, being the first ones to be told he is risen, we look at it now and we see what a gift it was. But these women, they didn't understand. They, they were shocked. This gift that was waiting for them was not something they could receive immediately. They didn't, they didn't know what to do with it. You know, I see this as an invitation. He is risen. Come receive this gift. Come to the tomb. Um, Whatever it is in your life, wherever you are, and whatever is, is calling to your heart, pulling on your heartstrings, if you think about something in your life right now that you're torn about, that you're a little unsure, if we follow the path of these women, then we would follow our heart. We would follow compassion to find 
the empty tomb. The next verse, the last verses we're going to read, um, says this young man that had been dressed in white speaking, and he says, but go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. You know, it's interesting that these powerless and fearless women were now asked to face their own fears because they were fearless in the way that they went to the tomb, in the way that they stood by the cross. But they had their own fears, as we all do. Familiar with powerlessness, they were not deterred from going to the tomb, but the powerlessness of their social standing, that had a cost. These women, they could make themselves invisible. They could do the next thing without any expectation of control or acknowledgement. They had long since accepted that they were less important than the enslaved people or the livestock that, were, that surrounded them. But this was not the way of the kingdom that Jesus brings. Equality and the value of all humans are central to his teaching. And Jesus, even in his resurrection, would not allow the women to remain invisible and silent just because it was easy and safe. It's easy to assume that the women ran from the tomb terrified because they had seen this man in white. It's easy to think, well, maybe they ran away because they expected to find a dead body, and they did not. You know, I think these women ran away. I think they were terrified because they felt like imposters. Surely Jesus had expected the disciples to be the ones who came. Surely he would have thought that the disciples would be the ones receiving this message from the young man in white. Now these women figured they had messed things up. They shouldn't have come to the tomb. Maybe they had done a wrong thing. And now Jesus' message would be compromised. They would have been given the message instead of the disciples, and who was going to believe them? They ran away terrified. And yet we know Jesus did give them the message. It was a beautiful first act in the new kingdom. This kingdom built on powerlessness instead of power must begin with a proclamation of powerlessness. What is more upside down to the way of thinking of this world than a message entrusted to the untrustworthy? You know, Jesus requires much of us who would live as citizens of his new kingdom, but it's not what we think. He doesn't require us to be holy or sinless or even good. He requires us to face our fears and to step into the vulnerable place where we have no power. He asks us to receive and offer only forgiveness and love, never power and control. This is the glory of Easter morning. A kingdom built on forgiveness and love, not simply as a door, a way into the kingdom, but as the mechanism that makes the kingdom grow and exist, the currency, if you will, that carries the kingdom forward. This Easter, I would urge you to seek out an area where you are powerless. Go there to receive your resurrection gift. Amen. I do have a couple of questions for your groups or just to ponder in your own heart or speak with a friend. The first question is, discuss the similarities between the way the Romans ruled by power and the way we think of power today in our world. And share a story, if you can, about a time that you felt powerless. Did that experience create compassion that wasn't in your heart before? Have a blessed Easter morning. <laughs>